In the Season 4 episode Sharpshooters, Rick was offered a 1915 Ford Model T Custom Woody, a customized early generation Ford model that has a huge sentimental value for any gearhead. A 1915 Model T Taxi. It's older than you, Grandpa. A little bit, not much. <laughs> According to Danny Coker, this Model T taxi had an estimated value of $29,000 and Rick ended up buying it for $21,000. This looks like a decent deal, but it turned out that it was far from it. The car not only had an unoriginal four-cylinder Chevy engine on it, but also a modern turnkey ignition system as well as a built-in CD player, which is not a good thing if you're into vintage cars. Rick eventually managed to sell the car for $29,700 at a Barron Jackson auction, but after commissions, that left him with $23,760, which makes a profit of just $2,760. Add to that the cost of storage, transportation, taxes, transfer, and fix-up, and you will see that this was ultimately a pretty big bust. A 1969 Chevrolet Camaro Z28 is an absolute classic, and so Corey couldn't resist when he was offered one. He bought the vintage muscle car for a whopping $40,000 simply because he wanted to personally own the car. However, his father was having none of it, instead complaining about Corey's lavish spending habits and trying to sell the car for $65,000 in various venues. Rick later went down to $50,000, but the Camaro just wouldn't sell, and one quick look online will show that even today, Haggerty values the car at just $36,000, which is a whole four grand less than Corey spent on it and far from making the pawn shop a profit. In this pick, we're going back to 2013 in the episode titled Sticks and Stones from Season 8, when a man named Tom walked into the gold and silver pawn shop with a framed letter signed by Napoleon. Corey, who just happened to be there, thought it was very cool and was curious to learn how the man got his hands on it, so Tom simply said that he got it online and was looking to get rid of it for some extra cash. That's really cool. Where'd you get this? Online. I've been told by my wife that I had a bit of a Napoleon complex. I can see that. <laughs> the man didn't know what the letter was about, however, as it was written in French, but according to him, the online seller from which he bought it was very reputable, so it had to be a unique piece of history worth $10,000. After going into a bit of Napoleon's background and history, something that he must have gotten from his father, Corey inspected the letter and concluded that the seal on the letter seems legit, as it was a type of seal that was used back then. Tom had also brought a certificate of authenticity which was good enough for Corey to get down to haggling without even consulting his expert buddies. For him, the asking price of 10 grand was way too high, and he immediately cut it down to $1,500. When Tom said that that's ridiculously low, Corey pointed out that Napoleon was the emperor of pretty much whole Europe and that he had probably signed a lot of documents in his lifetime. Nevertheless, Tom tried to raise the price to $5,000 but Corey eventually talked him down to a reasonable $2,000, saying that he would have to reframe the document and that it requires a lot of work. They shook hands, and Corey was pretty proud of the sweet deal he made when he told Rick and the old man, but even though it could have been huge, Rick quickly bummed him out for not consulting anyone about the purchase. To be on the safe side, Rick told Corey to take the item to UNLV history professor Gregory Brown to confirm the authenticity. I'm not going to sell something like this to someone for 12 grand and not know for sure it's real. Why don't you go down and see Greg at UNLV, see what he has to say. He reluctantly did so, and it turned out that the signed proclamation was issued to soldiers after the famous Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, which was one of Napoleon's greatest victories when his Grand Army fought against Russo-Austrian Army. Professor Brown added that the battle was also important because of Napoleon's battle strategy and maneuvering, which was revolutionary for the time, and allowed his army to split the enemy and win. The only problem was, the item that Corey had bought was not the one of the original manuscript copies, but a replica. And with $2,000 that went down the drain, you would have thought that Corey has learned his lesson, but obviously that was not the case. Corey, why don't you take it home and remind yourself not to be so damn stupid? <sighs> Fine. Dumb kid. The guys at the gold and silver pawn shop love vintage cars and have a hard time resisting the urge to buy them, which has cost them quite a bit of money over the years. 
In the season 3 episode Case Closed, for example, a woman offered them a 1974 Lotus Europa, a fairly small car that was quite popular during its day and one of the best sports cars around in the 1970s. Only 9300 were produced between 1966 and 1975, so Rick knew that this was a pretty rare offer and he ended up buying the car for $13,000. Despite its popularity and pristine condition, however, the car sat in the shop for a year, which eventually prompted Rick to try and sell it for $1,000 less than he had paid for it. But it wasn't until the Pawn Stars brought the Lotus to eBay that they finally sold it, receiving $15,350 for it. Although this was more than he had paid for it, with shipping costs, Rick was left with a profit that was marginal, or possibly even negative. Even though he is a pretty smart businessman in real life, having started his own merchandise company and opened a candy shop with his brother, among other things, Chumley still has the reputation as the lovable fool on Pawn Stars, and it sometimes seems like he is trying his best to maintain this reputation. More often than not, Chumley appears to be the one who is making some bad deals at the shop, and one of those was made during an episode of season 15, when he took a pretty unlucky guess on the value of 7 boxes of old comic books. The seller had inherited the collection from her recently deceased grandfather and apparently had no idea what it was worth. She had originally asked for $2,000 before striking a deal with Chumley at $500. This is how you do it, Antoine. This is how you make a name for yourself in this business. When these are going to be worth five grand, I'm going to be the one who gets the reward. After an expert checked the comics out, he came to the conclusion that they would sell for about $200 if the Paw Stars were lucky. Naturally, his bosses were pretty angry about the whole thing, as it wasn't the first time he lost their shop some money. So they're basically worthless. No, they're not worthless. <sighs> thanks for stopping by, man. Anytime. Appreciate it. All right, Take care. thanks for the bad news. Each and every one of us has that one favorite movie, TV show, or whatever that holds such a special place in our hearts that we gladly go out of our way to get a piece of memorabilia or a prop related to it. Being a human being just like the rest of us, Rick also has a soft spot for one movie in particular, as we've seen in the episode titled La La Land from season 14 of Pawn Stars, where he behaved quite out of character. Ever since he saw Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory at a young age, Rick has been an avid fan of the movie's title character. The man that came to the shop carrying the props that were used in the movie, a golden egg, a golden ticket, Willy Wonka's hat, Wonka bars, and most important of all, the everlasting gobstopper knew this, and Rick could barely contain himself. The real deal? I'm even getting chills holding it. <sighs> it's like the Hope Diamond. The man took advantage of Rick's love for the movie and made it crystal clear right away that Rick is going to have to pay up if he wants just one item from his collection, probably referring to the Gobstopper. I, I gotta stick with $100,000 for the Gobstopper. The item he knew Rick would want the most. Reliving childhood memories, Rick stepped out of his usual character and immediately struck a deal with the man without even trying to haggle and without investigating the authenticity of the items. I'm gonna miss that everlasting Gobstopper. Sweet! You got a deal. It's like the fountain of youth. I'm seven years old again. Rick bought the Gobstopper believing that the ultimate Willy Wonka prop would bring customers to the shop, but at the end of the day, he got played as the price of the Gobstopper actually ranges from twenty to $40,000. Next up we have another muscle car that the guys from the gold and silver pawn shop just couldn't say no to, but unfortunately, this 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner turned out to be a pretty bad purchase as well. Corey came across this vintage car at a Florida auction that he and Rick were attending, and it ended up being another impulse buy. You know son, it's just a lot of work. There's a reason they don't make them like this anymore, you work on them all the time. Listen buddy, you're flying home, I'm driving home, and I'm driving home in this. After spending $45,000 on the car despite knowing that it didn't have the original engine, Corey and Rick then decided to drive it all the way back to Vegas, which is obviously not a great idea if you're looking to sell the car. Oh, you Corey, this thing don't even start. After spending another $7,800 in commission fees, the guy still couldn't find a buyer, and seeing as you can find Roadrunners selling for somewhere between $30,000 and $50,000, it looks like this will turn out to be yet another big bust. 
In season 15, a man called Kevin came to the gold and silver pawn shop offering Chemley a 1957 custom Gibson Les Paul guitar made for the 2006 US Open. The guitar featured several famous tennis players such as Andre Agassi, and although Kevin was a huge guitar fan, he wasn't really into the tennis stuff and he was ready to part with the instrument he had received as a gift. Chumley pointed out that Gibson guitars were quite collectible, with Les Paul being the best model, while the US Open is one of the biggest events in tennis. And people pay top dollar for them. And the US Open is one of the biggest events in tennis. I mean, put the two together, game, set, match, baby. This thing is a winner. He wasn't willing to meet Kevin's asking price of $5,000 though, but the two eventually agreed on $3,500, which, according to Kevin, is what the guitar goes for. Anyone who has ever watched the show knows that the guys always need to make some kind of profit and will normally not go as high as the current market price, so it didn't come as a surprise when Rick was less than thrilled about Chum's purchase. He was already shocked that Chumley had bought the ugly guitar in the first place and got even more irritated when he heard the price he had paid. 3500 I got it for a smoking deal. Have you ever seen someone playing a guitar with old tennis players on it? But unfortunately, things got even worse. Guitar expert Jesse valued the unique guitar at around three grand, a whole 500 bucks less than Chumley had paid for it, so the Pawn Stars definitely lost money in this deal. Um, hmm. I would say it's probably worth right around three. No one's gonna buy this. No one's gonna buy it. Thank you for checking this video out, and don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe for new videos every day. Turn that bell notification on and comment down below that you subscribed, and we'll make sure to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Once again, thank you for watching and see you next time.